we're going to learn how to make an Adobe mixture from Terran Robotics, the team behind this awesome autonomous construction drone that aims to address the affordable housing crisis. Let's jump right into it. The first material you'll use is straw. This helps provide some tensile strength. The next is gravel. This improves the strength of the wool. Clay acts as the binder that holds it all together. You can add other ingredients, but these are the natural basics that have been used forever. And also water. The main idea is to mix these things together evenly. As you can see, they're each conveniently used in equal parts. Traditionally, this would be done in a pit. The materials would all be poured together and mixed up by stomping on them repeatedly. But Terran Robotics likes to use this tart method for small batches so that they can mix things conveniently inside without having too much of a cleanup process afterwards. The goal is to spread everything around evenly. You can see they put in the clay and the gravel, started to pour some water in, and at this point added the straw. The water goes in gradually. It's easy to put too much water in quickly. Then you continue to work the material, pulling the tarp over it so that it gets dispersed as homogeneously as possible. There are a few different methods to mix up the material. It's best to use a combination of them. Here you can see a stomping method. Conveniently, the tarp keeps the shoes from getting too muddy. When people are afraid of artificial intelligence, in automated jobs are so typically hand-based. It's just that like, it's nice to keep this sort of technology in startups. Like finding a way for, it's like not all centralized. So this is called the ball test. You just make a you know, small ball. Oh, often people are like dropping from an ish a meter. So I'm gonna go with ish a half a Danny. So like that. So looking forward to, to splay out a little bit without any cracking or fracturing. This is actually pretty close. I don't know if I'd add much more water to this or not. I'd like to see the, the scrawl a little more evenly through the mix, uh, which I'll do by kind of rolling it a few more times. But yeah. Drop test, ball test. <laughs> what percent complete would you say the mix is at this point? Honestly, I think at this point we could probably use it. Um, I'd like to see it a little more, you know, when you're like rolling these over, it makes a kind of burrito shape. I'd like to see that burrito shape pulling together just a bit better, especially like through here. But yeah, pretty close. Burrito style, it's kind of a consistent mix now. The cracking's a whole lot less. Um, So probably a little wetter than we've mixed it if we were using different tools, but it's starting to feel good. So there again, like, I don't know, softball sized. Handle this stuff, balled up. I usually drop, I don't know, around my waist pipe. Good to go? Yep. So it's got a bit of display. You know, this uh, tarp method, um, it's not one we use very much in the shop. Occasionally we'll do like a small batch with it if we're doing testing, but uh, when we're on build sites, we prefer to use mortar mixers at the very least or bigger equipment if possible. Um, always kind of exploring how to mix more of this faster, better, more completely. Uh, but for today, this gives us, you know, a good look at what we've got to work with and uh, gets people's mind in the right place. It's a very plastic material. It's made with uh, very cheap uh, gravel, clay. Uh, a lot of this is byproduct from sites. So yeah, very cheap mix. This is uh, not the way we typically do it, but it works well enough for today. Yeah, so we're just slowly applying, uh, applying force to this block here uh, and measuring how much, uh, yeah, how much force it takes. Uh, to crush it. Pound feet or what's the... These are, these are in uh, pounds. You can see the fibers running inside the crack. That's what's like keeping it from just a catastrophic failure is the micro uh, reinforcement.
so uh, they got up to like 3,000 black fights. This team is like 200 something PSI. Yeah. Yeah, code for uh, structural and cob is 85. Our tests the other day were, we got about 1,200 more. These are all experimental, different amounts of fiber, different types of mixing. Printed concrete is usually like 6,000 PSI, right? Uh, poured concrete's 4,500, so yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if it's 6,000. Right. Yeah. So, but Adobe I mean, only needs to be 85 to be, and that's code, is that an international code or a US code? Uh, IRC, yeah. yeah. Uh, I did into the IRC, or appendix, I get it. I, get it. I think it's an addendum. Um, wow. And so how much variance do you see in your compression strength? Well, with these three different tests right now, somewhere around 100-ish PSI. We did not start out as earthen building evangelists. We, we, we realized there were some problems in how people are living, and we thought, what can we do to solve those problems? And it, that led us to automation and to, to Cobb. Um, and the big ones are, are loneliness and isolation and a lack of community, and the fact that most of our building materials are fucking, they're killing us. Um, and so we thought, is there a natural material that the process that is suited to dense communal living? Uh, and and the answer is cob. And it itself is so cheap. It's dirt cheap. It's a pun, I guess. It's dirt cheap. Uh, and actually, the process of building it traditionally is a very communal one. You're bringing people together to actually make the houses they're going to be inhabiting. Obviously, in the current market system, that's untenable. People cannot afford that or they're unwilling to afford it. Um, and so that's where the robot comes in and the AI. Um, but even without, even with the loss of communal construction of these, these homes, um, they are, because of the material, dignified homes. And they're ones that invite a sort of neighborhood or even city scale naturally. They're soundproof and not and not just soundproof but unlike concrete they don't reverberate or bounce sound they're bulletproof which is a lot of fun to prove um they have that biblio sorry biophilic quality they the the lines are never super sharp uh the the, the earth feels like earth it looks like earth so people even when they're super divorced from you know the natural environment in the in our built environment there will be some natural qualities that are that are outstanding so we just think it's a more dignified way to live in addition to being incredibly affordable um, but the, the really cool thing about all this for me is that it adds up to a neighborhood scale or a city scale. And so for that, our, our designs are reflecting that. You know, not only are we radically changing the way we design a home to accommodate an eight foot, hopefully soon smaller drone, uh, and what does that mean for constructing it? So, you know, whereas normally you might have rebar sticking up every so often, well, how's a drone navigate around that? Or if you're gonna spend a lot of money having somebody come and install lintels above a door or a window, that's more labor. Do we just bring our windows all the way to the roof? Can I'll be out of course. So this, this is kind of our first standard home that we designed. And as you can see, our goal early on was, can we make it look something like a home that people would recognize, um, that, that people wouldn't be afraid of, uh, which, which I, think we, I think we are to some degree underestimating public appetite for, for new and interesting designs. But so early on we were looking at, what, do we, what does it look like for us to build a standard single family home, which philosophically, I think none of us are on board with. I don't think we need more single family homes in America, but, but it was an interesting design exercise. This is, I don't even know how to pronounce it. It's an ancient Chinese multifamily style of living. Giant circular. Uh, it was designed to kind of, you know, you'd have essentially a town and the exterior walls of that town would also be the exterior walls of the people's homes or, or you know, often might serve also as a granary or livestock. And we just think, let's just make that a neighborhood. Instead of having just sprawling area with like giant lawns, what if the lawn, what if there was an internal facing but communal courtyard and this external thing. And, you know, we don't want things to feel like a fortress, but, but our, you know, we do have thick walls. They have a certain strength to them. Let's play to that strength visually. So this is kind of in between. So this is a multifamily structure um, and it's just kind of a straightforward townhouse. So you're sharing a wall, a party wall, a common wall, uh, because our material is what it is. It's going to be, it's going to be plenty of privacy, but again, you're getting that, enough interaction with your neighbors that it is inviting a different, we hope, different quality of living, not just with the structure, but with the interactions that it engenders. But you know, so this would be, this is a kind of a, a section view, and you can see some of the wild things we can do. So all these built-ins or carve-outs, um, and people can really, you know, you can make it your own. We do have paints that will work with this, um, different plaster finishes, or you keep it the, the raw earthen plaster. So even when you do 
what has kind of become standard in modern construction, where you are standardizing, um, there is plenty of room for idiosyncrasy in our design. People can bring their own kind of eccentric design to it, and we're trying to make spaces that people can really inhabit. So we think of our, we, we don't think of it so much as walls, we're trying to create a substrate where a competent electrician or just a person who wants to try something out can come in and apply their trade on it.